By now, throughout the world, the term shroud refers to a linen cloth, 4 meters 42 centimeters in length, 1 meter 13 centimeters in width, that has been kept in Turin since 1578. On this light yellow ochre sheet, there are visible imprints that reproduce the frontal image, left, and dorsal image, right, of a human body. There also appear numerous other marks left by the vicissitudes suffered by the shroud during its life. The frontal image shows the face crowned by long hair and a thick beard, the thorax, the arms crossed over the pubic area and the legs stretched out. The posterior image shows the nape of the neck, the back, the outstretched legs, and the soles of the feet. In particular, one notes two black lines running parallel to the longer side, burn marks caused by a fire that broke out in 1532 in the Saint-Chapelle at Chambéry, then housing the shroud folded in a silver box. The two black singed lines are due to contact with the overheated sides of the box. During the fire, a drop of molten metal fell onto the sheet, passing through every layer, destroying the fabric. This explains the symmetrical repetition of numerous triangular holes along the two black lines. In 1534, these holes were repaired by the Clare nuns of Chambéry, who covered them with patches. In addition to reinforce the area of the sheet damaged by the fire, the sisters sewed both the shroud and the patches to a sheet of linen called Holland cloth. For conservation reasons, these patches were removed in 2002 and the Holland cloth substituted by a new backing fabric, recognizable under the burns because of its different color and weft with respect to the shroud. In the central area of the sheet, there are a series of large rhomboidal marks with jagged edges. These were caused by the water that soaked the shroud at some time in its history. There are also four symmetrical groups of roundish burn marks, smaller than the former, which, without doubt, date from before the Chambéry fire. In this case, too, the new backing cloth appears beneath the holes, recognizable by its different color and weft. Along the upper edge, an eight centimeter wide strip of the same material as the shroud has been sewn on. Its extreme edges have two large gaps under which the new fabric can be seen. A 
Along the lower edge of the left-hand gap, there is the area from which the two most recent material samples were taken for scientific purposes in 1973 and 1988. The shroud fabric consists of a valuable linen that appears to be hand-woven with a characteristic typical of herringbone cloth. The longitudinal strips, about one centimeter wide, are highly visible when the cloth is illuminated with close-up light. Upon enlargement, the herringbone weave is clearly visible. The face of the man of the shroud bears numerous bruised lesions that coroners have carefully studied. Swellings have been identified that appear coherent with hematoma. These are particularly visible on the right side of the face that is more swollen than the left. Furthermore, there are marks attributable to lacerated and contused wounds. The nasal septum is bent, caused by a fracture. All things considered, the man of the shroud appears to have been savagely beaten during the hours preceding his death. On the forehead, nape of the neck, and in the hair, one can observe numerous sinuous rivulets of blood originating from wounds caused by pointed objects with a small diameter. They radiate out from the head and appear to have been caused by a crown of sharp thorns placed on the head itself. The characteristics of the blood traces leaving the wounds allow the distinction between lesions involving arterial and venal vessels. Of particular interest is the blood stain in the center of the forehead, coming from a wound to a frontal vein that has the form of an upturned three, because it follows the lines of the forehead itself. On the right-hand side of the chest, there is a large blood stain originating from an oval wound caused by a pointed cutting object that struck between the fifth and sixth rib and penetrated deeply. The characteristics of this wound are important in that they show that it was inflicted after the death of the subject. The blood that spurted out of the wound is surrounded by a serous halo that is typical of blood flowing out of a corpse in which the serum and corpuscles have already separated. The frontal image of the shroud shows clear signs of the imprints left by the arms. These are stretched out with the hands crossed in the pubic region. On both forearms, there are long blood stains beginning at the wrist and flowing up to the elbow. Their direction appears unnatural as they seem to be flowing upwards. One must bear in mind that we are dealing with blood stains formed when the body was hanging on the cross and the wrists were higher than the elbows. The left wrist shows clear signs of a characteristic blood stain formed by two diverging trails of blood related to the two different positions assumed by the condemned on the cross, the prostrate and the erect. The blood flows out of an oval wound caused by a pointed instrument such as a nail. The location of this wound is of particular interest, not being on the palm of the hand as depicted in traditional iconographic representations of the crucifixion, but on the wrist. Of particular interest 
is the absence of thumbs on the image of the shroud, and this could have been caused by either the lesion of the median nerve or a tetanic contraction. The skin of the thorax and back have over a hundred excoriated round and linked bruises, about two centimeters in length, that are also visible on the lower limbs. These appear to be lesions caused by the flagrum, a Roman torture instrument, consisting of a wooden handle and thongs, at the end of which were attached two small dumbbell pieces of lead. It is difficult to establish the number of flagrum blows inflicted because we do not know the number of thongs on the flagrum. What we do know is that the torture was inflicted on a bent back with the body naked. At the height of the left scapular region and above the right shoulder, one can observe quadrangular bruises related to the marks left by a rough, heavy object that can be identified as the patibulum, the horizontal axis of the cross that the condemned sometimes carried to the place of execution. Finally, at the height of the kidneys, one observes a transversal blood flow that crosses the whole back. This is the blood spurting from the rib wound when the body, once removed from the cross, was laid in a horizontal position. The lower limbs of the man of the shroud are easily discernible, both in the anterior and posterior images. Both knees show abrasion, very probably caused by falls, because in these areas, as on the soles of the feet, traces of soil have been identified. It is also worth noting that the left knee has been fixed by rigor mortis in a more bent position than the right one, and, as a result, the left leg appears shorter than the right one. The sole of the right foot is clearly imprinted, while the left one has only the posterior part near the heel visible. This suggests that the crucifixion took place using only one nail and by placing the left foot on top of the right. On the sole of the latter, one notes the exit hole of the nail from which depart the rivulets of blood descending towards the toes. The corporeal imprints that one sees on the shroud are dark in the relief areas, while light in the others. The image, therefore, has a light distribution opposite to that which we actually see. The imprint therefore appears to be the same as a photographic negative. By changing the image of the shroud into its photographic negative, light and shade are obviously inverted, and this, therefore, shows the true aspect of the man of the shroud, as we would observe were he in front of us. <laughs>